Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today, I'm going to be flying in Zero G. So if you're a regular watcher of this channel or any anything space related, you probably know what's going on here. This is an aircraft which flies special trajectories to let people inside it experience low and even zero gravity and float around and, you know, do science. Okay, I admit there wasn't a lot of science going on. This was a public flight with people that had paid to do this for fun. I, of course, was the complete dark and was trying to uh, you measure the rotation of the cabin by spinning an object around and watching the gyroscopic effect, but that didn't work very well on account of the, well, the bodies flying around in the air in the cabin. But seriously though, it was an amazing experience and I'm glad to have got like one step up the ladder of space tourism. You may well remember these people who this was one step on their trip, right? The moment where they were acclimatizing themselves to the experience of being in zero gravity because they would go on to spend three days in orbit in a Dragon spacecraft. So now at this point, the Federal Trade Commission insists that I tell you that the Zero Gravity Corporation paid for this flight. They had a spare seat, they put me in it, I did my stuff and I, in, in return, they want me to promote this to you, right? This is a sponsored video. And of course, it's not like this is selling some rubbish VPN thing or low quality earbuds. This is just, this is something that you all know whether you want to do or not. And I expect that it's very close to 90 plus percent if you think this is one of the things you would love to do at some point in your life. So selling you on the concept, that's easy. Selling you on the price, that's a little harder. This is a, an experience that lasts a couple of hours but costs thousands of dollars. It is something which is absolutely unique and the good news is that in their infinite generosity they have allowed me to share a discount code that's a ZG Scott Manley or Zulu Golf Scott Manley. Type that in uh, when you're signing up and you'll get a bit of a discount which will, well, lighten load so to speak. And as space tourism goes, it's definitely one of the lower cost options. You know, this is thousands of dollars. Flying to on a suborbital flight is hundreds of thousands of dollars for a few minutes. And of course, going to space is several days for about $50 million. And it turns out that in terms of dollars per zero G second, this is actually the cheapest. Anyway, I really want to talk about the mechanics of all of this. This is a civilian operated flight. It actually has replaced NASA's Office of Low Gravity and now NASA pays to fly their experiments on this flight when they need you know, low gravity environments. NASA had been operating their own program since the 1950s. They started out with a, a C-131 Samaritan and that was quickly replaced by a pair of C-135 Stratotankers which were converted for zero-g use. And in the tw uh, 21st century, they got a C-9B Skytrain, which operated for a few years before they finally passed it over to the private uh, companies. That transition took about 20 years. In the 1990s, NASA was directed to look for commercial replacements. It took them a while to define their requirements. And so Zero Gravity Corporation come along and it takes them about a decade to go from the idea to getting a patent on the you know changes that they need to make to an aircraft to make it suitable uh, to finally getting their first NASA contracts and by about 2014 NASA finally closed its office of zero G research and uh, zero gravity corporation are the the main supplier right now but because they're now a private corporation doing this, it means they can sell tickets to random members of the public. Plebs like me can enjoy this experience. Of course, because it's a private company performing a flight that has to actually comply with federal aviation regulations for airliners, that means, for example, that everybody has to go through the standard TSA security check for liquids and weapons and stuff and there needs to be a standard passenger briefing. And there are differences with this aircraft. The oxygen masks are in completely different positions. So these commercial flights operate out of several cities across the USA. I think it's only the USA because of noise regulations regarding this old aircraft. But yeah, the plane basically flies in, meets a bunch of passengers and gives them the tour, and then flies on to the next city. Okay, so this, I'm gonna be flying in this, this is a, 727 227F. It is a 1976 Boeing 727, which has been converted to fly in COG. Okay. 
Wow. Rear entry on the stairs. That is some um, old school stuff. Hello. Hi. Got my pass. All right. You're in 3D. 3D. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Fly safe, huh? Yeah. Hey. Oh my god, how will I ever find the road? There's so many. Right there. 3D. Oh, I got an aisle seat. Okay. All of the cities they operate out of are fairly large, which means the airspace is, you know, pretty congested. So typically they'll fly out for about 30, 40 miles, and then they have a box allocated in Class A airspace above 18,000 feet, where they can basically fly their maneuvers and then turn around. And as long as they stay within that region, they're guaranteed that nobody else will be vectored into their airspace. The initial few parabolas are flown at lunar gravity just to help you get adapted. Uh, also, they tell everyone to lay on the backs because that tends to be better for uh, dealing with motion sickness. And actually, I don't think we had anyone on our flight that had any problems with that. The biggest problem is that you're just simply not used to it. So early on, you spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to get up and then, you know, you end up jumping and bumping into the ceiling even when you don't try. You see me messing around with my phone, that's because I had a G-meter app running on my phone and I wanted to show the transition from the hypergravity. At this point it was only 1.6. I think the highest I saw it go was like 1.9. And of course, as you transition out of the climb, it starts to drop off. And I really wanted to get this photo of my iPhone just floating around in the air with a zero G on it. Turns out things weren't quite as cool as I expected because my GoPro was a very old model and all the images tended to be kind of blurry. Still, it's the thought that counts. I can also confirm that doing one-arm push-ups in lunar gravity is a whole lot easier than Earth gravity on account of the fact that I can do more than one. But soon, the flight was over and I got to do the little ritual where you step out and have your badge flip the right way up to show that you are a zero-g veteran get, you know, my photo for the archives, but then my trip wasn't finished because I wanted to spend some time talking to these guys. These are the pilots, and I wanted to get into the details of how this actually works. I'm pretty sure you're familiar with the concept. The aircraft pulls into a very steep climb, so it's going upwards very fast, and then they just push the nose down and let the aircraft follow a trajectory that it would follow if it were just being affected by gravity. And that means that everything in the back is basically feeling that fall as if it were in zero G. But there's a time limit for how long they can do this. Eventually they reach the top of their arc and start descending and picking up more speed. And eventually they have to pull out of this dive before they reach the point where they would exceed the structural limits of the aircraft. This gives everyone in the back of the aircraft just over 20 seconds of reduced gravity. Okay, let's uh, wander up to the front of the plane. This is uh, where the magic happens, okay? Hello? Hey, how's it going? Oh, it's uh, going great. Derek. Derek, hi, pleased to meet you. Nice to meet you. I am very excited uh, about the work you've just done. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. We enjoy doing this work. Let's take a enjoy. look at this, yeah. Because I'm going to say, I'm, I'm currently learning to fly. My plane has way more screens than this one. Yeah. A service yeah, SR20. It's old. like all, yeah, exactly. It's great. But what there's a whole lot of. Oh, yeah, yeah. You do have some retrofitted stuff here, right? Yeah. What does the beer low button do? It never, it never uh, comes on. Beer. We have our mechanic on top. Of that. <laughs> <laughs> when we get I need a picture of that one. Yeah. But this is a like it's a 727 yeah. from like 1970s, right? 1976, 727. 227. Yeah. Um, it is. It is the old school stuff. We're flying the needles. You're flying the needles. That's right. And so when you're actually flying the zero G, what's the? Is there a G meter here that you're reading? Yes. So is that that up there? Okay. Yeah. So that comes and up. A, and a standby right behind. You. Right, and I think I've seen that. So you pop that out, and you're basically trying to fly the corridor that sets that to zero. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you're doing this manually? All manually. So there's no like even yaw dampener or anything? No, we have a yaw damper. Okay. We have to because it's a swept wing aircraft. So okay. We have the yaw dampers on all the time, but we don't use any auto automation autopilot to fly it. It's very 
by feel. Um, Even our approaches, we, yeah. you have to hand fly them because yeah. the autopilot yeah. just doesn't keep up. Yeah, we have no. You have more technology in your SR20. Is it a G6 SR20? It's a G6. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. G6 SR20 is going to have uh, the same kind of technology as like an Airbus or a modern Boeing, yeah. and this is an older Boeing. And uh, we have a UNS1. Right. Uh, okay. But it's been only mostly functions as a uh, GPS. Right. To get us around the country. And so typically one of you is flying, right? It's not like... Yeah, left seater flies. We swap. We're both captains. Okay. Uh, the right seater controls the throttles during the parabolic maneuvers. And we want to, you know, control the engine so we're not over boosting. Mm -hmm. or... And the engineer holds us down. So we'll <laughs> Actually, this is Carlos. He was born with the airplane. He came from Boeing with He came with, the with it. And he's been installed ever since. Yeah. Uh, I helped build it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but and and so to I'm really curious. You get through the ballistic. You fly through this parabolic arc, right? Yeah. And a lot of people think it's just like controlling the pitch, but you have to control the thrust, right? Yes, everything. And the yaw. You have to keep everything on the needle. Every variable. There's wind up there. We got to deal with. Uh -huh. You know, the wind will roll the airplane in either direction, and we have to compensate for that. Just kind of let it. Because you're going through multiple flight levels, and I guess there's yeah. wind shear between yeah. them, right? Uh, turbulence. Dealing with turbulence. We didn't have much today. Very which is lovely. great. Um, yeah, great. But we did have a very strong wind of 66 knots that we had to contend with. And, and mm -hmm. uh, we kind of take the feel out of it so you guys don't feel it back there. Yeah. Also, the engines are used to control drift. So, you know, people moving forward and backwards in the cabin. We have an accelerometer that shows um, the X axis across the aircraft so we can see uh, if we're accelerating or decelerating. And with the number two engine, he'll control. Uh, that way that you guys don't all go to the back of the airplane or all to the front of the airplane right. and keep you in the center. Um, and then we, uh, our, our highest level of technology that's in the aircraft, that's actually top secret. I shouldn't be saying this for yes. YouTube, uh, but it's the duck. And the we duck. the duck up and the, the, the aviator duck shows us if it's where it's drifting. And if you're slightly negative G or slightly positive G, where we're trending, it shows trend. So, uh, I mean, how fast are you doing these maneuvers at then? Uh, as fast as you can go. So, so this, I think, <laughs> doesn't the 727 go like 0. 0.9? This will do 0. 0.87 and 350. Okay. okay. Yeah, so we bring it right up to the, right up to the, right the bar and then start the fall. Right, so you basically go into the climb at the start of the, and then by the time you go zero, you've lost a bit, I guess? We're down at two, uh, 235 and then we count it in. So around 200, 210, 200, yeah. we push. And then the power comes okay. out, the number two, you keep some thrust up. Yeah. And then, um, it just depends on the day how slow you go. I mean, I've seen it down to 100 knots. 100 knots at the yeah. apex. But you're a zero G, so you can't stall this thing if it's going the right it's, way. It's, it's zero, zero angle of attack. Right. Yeah. Ideally. Yeah. <laughs> and so through your, you've got three engines, but I hear that only the center engine is providing thrust. Yeah, we use the center engine only during the parabola. Because we had all three, and you have, imagine you have zero induced drag. Yeah. Right? The plane's going to accelerate right away. So we left all three engines up. You have zero induced drag on the on the wing. Mm -hmm. It's going to it's going to go. Right. So we, number one and three are at idle, and number two we move it in the center, kind of mid power range to pressurize the airplane and control the drift and keep it from accelerating or decelerating too much. And like at the bottom of the arc, do you bring the other engines oh, in? As yeah. we're, when we come out, we're about forty five degrees nose low. We yeah. Use that momentum to accelerate, along with pushing the power levers up to ninety percent. Right, and then just use that energy to go back right up into the next one. Right, because I mean, I'm just, I'm just thinking this through. Those engines have lag time, and you have to plan yeah, this to thing plan. out. Yep. Do you have like a checklist that you go through in real time? Yeah, or? We, have, we have checklists. Or... Checklists are for professionals. We got it all. Up here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I've heard that. We do everything by by feel. We don't even read. <laughs> <laughs> This is such an amazing piece of hardware. I'm just sorry. I love one of the things that the beauty. You know, American like aircraft, American airline industry, well, really worldwide now. I mean, everything's up to snuff as far as automation and technology. So if you have an engine failure and you're flying on Delta or United, the computer is going to take care of a lot of stuff. And this airplane, he is the computer. So right. when we have a problem, he's handling it manually, moving valves, moving fluids, yeah. moving energy. And, and doing that kind of stuff. So you really, he, he, these guys have to be on their game more than pilots. Yeah. They really have to know the airplane in and out. Yeah, I mean, this is just automated in a lot of modern stuff that we've ever had. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. We only yeah. deal with that. We so. Basically, everything has to work on this airplane. To do what we do, everything. All the electrics have to work, the fuel pumps have to work, all the hydraulics, basically. Pressurization is a must. Yeah. Everything's got to be functioning. Or so, we don't do it. 
that's this is this is awesome. Um, should I? And is it worth talking about the changes, the modifications to this, or you want to? There's really none. I mean, we pressurize the hydraulic system. That's it. It is a yeah, standard right. 727. So, it has regular wing spar. That we haven't added any strengthening to it or yeah. anything like that. So, like the engines will run at like zero Gs without any oil issues. Okay. No problem. Wow. No, no, they they won't stall or anything. Or anything. Slides come out occasionally, but it's normal. Right. The, the low oil pressure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah if it, they don't, something's wrong. Yeah. We run all <laughs> the fuel pumps. Obviously, the fuel is floating around in the tanks. Yeah. But we have a minimum amount of fuel that we have to have in the tanks to do parabolas, and we stay well above that. Oh, okay, so that's your plan. Yeah. You basically have extra... So you land with extra fuel, I guess. Oh, yeah. We, we leave topped off all the time. We're topped off. Oh, okay, that's an interesting... Uh... We're, so we're pretty heavy on fuel when we came out of here today. And you just always have it in the tanks, then? Yeah. So in that's comparison to your SR20 with a, has an IO360 and yeah. 390, I'm sorry. Yeah. It, it, that burns maybe uh, 0.2 gallons on takeoff. We burn 350 gallons on takeoff. That's crazy! So anyway, I think we've got to the point where I'm contractually required again to try and sell this experience to you. And I think the best I can say is that there were people on this flight, it was their first experience, and by the time we were on the ground, they were already booking their next one. And if you are in that position where you want to get your ticket and fly, then go to the website, use the code ZGScottManly, uh, you'll get a small discount, and of course, when you start floating around the cabin, just remember, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.